I'm Brian Gastrucci, and I'm the president and CEO of the DeBeaumont Foundation. As always, we try to select topics that will be of greatest interest and support to you, and we've heard from many that you're getting questions about our return to in-person learning this fall. I have a 10 and a 12 year old, and I'm getting many of those same questions. One who is chomping at the bit to go back to school, and one who is very concerned and watches far too much CNN and is very concerned about the Delta variant. And as I've learned from talking with them and, and my own teachers uh, at our school, there are many evolving questions relevant to communicating with key constituents, with new information emerging on a daily basis. I mean, just earlier this week, the AAP recommended that there should be mask wearing in schools. However, we also know that several states have already prevented that as an option. So this webinar will really provide insights into consistent, timely, and fact-based messaging that will help parents, families, educators, and the media, along with policymakers and your community, understand these developments, make sense of them, and make the right decisions for our public. We are excited to have three panelists join us today. Dave Choksi, who's the Commissioner of Health for the City of New York, and Zink, who's the Chief Medical Officer for the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services, and also the ASTO President-Elect. And finally, Daya Bilal Threets, who is the Special Assistant to the Executive Director and Senior Advisor for Strategic Initiatives at the National Education Association. During the panel portion of the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat by sending a message to all panelists. We'll start with a moderated conversation, and then our speakers will have time to answer several of your questions in the second half of our webinar. As always, today's webinar is recorded, and it will be available on the Public Health Communications Collaborative website later this week along with all the previous webinars that we've held as part of our COVID-19 communication series. But before we get started, we wanted to give the speakers a sense of, of who's on the call and what your most pressing communications challenges are. This will also help them answer your questions later, and it helps us plan for the future. So in the WebEx platform, please answer these two questions. The first question, which term best describes where you work? The second question is, what is your most pressing communications challenge? Hopefully everyone will answer those. I can provide Jeopardy music if you'd like. I am no Alex Trebek, but I will do my best. It'll just take a minute for polling results to come up and we can take a look at them. So in the chat, in the polling, you should see this polling question. You have less than 30 seconds to answer the polling question. We should be seeing results shortly. Okay, excellent, we have some data. What we're seeing here is that Folks are really looking for those infographics and one pagers and the social media graphics messaging. Um, those are very high. This is, I think, extremely important as we talk more and more about disinformation and misinformation coming from various places. It is so important for public health practitioners to be out there and be talking to people because the only antidote to misinformation is trust and credibility. And you all have that. I think we also see um, tough Q&A content. That's up there, that's very helpful. And misinformation alerts, which we continue to do on the website. So, so thank you all for, for that. Uh, moving now to our, our speakers. We have some amazing folks here and I am excited to introduce them. I know we're having some technical issues with some of the speakers, but I'm gonna introduce all the speakers and hope that everyone finally joins us. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, Daya Bilal Threets. She is a labor and social justice and public education advocate who serves as a senior policy advisor at the National Education Association, the nation's largest union representing 3 million educators. Daya works to ensure that NEA's education policy provides, uh, her education policy priorities are shaped first and foremost by educators as well as parents and communities. She has a wide ranging experience leading national and international programming as well as political campaigns that advance racial and social justice, public education, and pro public education candidates. Dave Choksi is the commissioner of New York City. Uh, Dave has you know, prior experience uh, 
in public, private, nonprofit sectors, has worked at the New York City and State Departments of Health, including Louisiana Department of Health, uh, both before and after Hurricane Katrina. Served as the as part of the FEMA delegation to the New York City uh, from New York City after Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and he served as a White House fellow and was the principal advisor to the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Dave continues to provide primary care for patients and has been doing so at Bellevue Hospital since 2014. And finally, we have Ann Zink. She is the Chief Medical Officer for the State of Alaska. Um, Ann has been the Chief Medical Officer in Alaska since July 2019. And according to her, Alaska is a small, isolated microcosm of the U.S. healthcare system, where certain forces like distance, lack of referral centers, and community involvement help create better systems of care. She quickly became involved in helping improve systems of care, including state legislation to improve care coordination, opioid addiction, treatment options, integration between private systems and the VA, DOD, and IHS facilities, and more. In all the work that she does, she strives to create work environments, policies, and practices that are data-driven, foster collaboration, and build system efficiencies that put patients first. I would be remiss to not also mention that Anne is the incoming president for ASTO, and Dave is a proud member of the Big Cities Health Coalition, one of the nation's most prestigious membership organizations. So with that, let's get to the questions. Um, so for our first question, we're gonna give each panelist just a, a couple of, of minutes to give opening remarks. I mean, as we approach another back to school with COVID-19, what's the number one lesson that, that you've learned that's informing your communication strategy? We'll start with Anne and then move to Dave and then finally have Daya weigh in. So, Anne, what do you think? Awesome. Thanks, Brian. And thank you all for coming and attending today. It's a true honor uh, to be here uh, and be thinking about schools and thinking about our children. I think there's nothing more important than the health and well being of our future. Um, I, I asked about what is the number one thing I have learned. It fits perfectly into this conversation. And that is the fact that kids and families and communities know their principal, they know their teacher, they don't know their state health official, and that's awesome. They are really the public health front. Schools are public health. Um, and the partnership and collaboration that we do with schools to really move upstream, I kind of think of them as the handle on the deepest well. They are the ones who have that access to what this looks like in communities. And being able to partner with them for the health and well being uh, is huge. We in the state have used schools in so many different ways uh, to be able to partner. Even people like our seafood industry have used our schools' mitigation tools to keep their industry partners uh, safe in that space. So I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned is just the, the importance of uh, public health and tribal health in schools and in industry uh, and excited to have a robust conversation about what that looks like. Dave, what would you add? Um, well, thanks so much, uh, Brian. First of all, thanks for organizing this. I've really been um, looking forward to it. Uh, it comes at the perfect time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to participating, uh, but also learning from, uh, from everyone who's gathered here this afternoon. I think my comments really flow from uh, from Anne's, uh, which I very much agree with. Um, you know, I, I think about this very much in the same way as I think about um, taking care of my own patients. And you know, essentially, what what works in the exam room often works at the community level as well. Um, particularly, the idea of starting with um, you know what I think of as active humility. Um, active humility means that uh, the initial impulse is to listen, uh, to understand. And what I've found certainly over the last 18 months is that that goes such a long way because people are anxious, they're frightened. Um, they have particular you know, prior experiences that they're bringing to any conversation. Um, and even though we're often, as the health officials, look to to have the answers, um, you know, so much of it is just taking that extra step, you know, that beat at the beginning of a conversation uh, to welcome uh, people's thoughts, to welcome, you know, their sharing where their vantage point is on a particular conversation. I think that connects to the other thing, which, you know, I certainly try to um, practice in, in uh, both the exam room as well as uh, in public health, uh, which is leading with compassion and, um, you know, making sure that people know that um, it makes sense that someone would be 
frightened on behalf of their child. You know, it makes sense for teachers who left uh, their classroom at the height of the surge here in New York City in March of 2020, um, and then returned in the fall, but with some of their colleagues not being able to join because uh, because they had passed away from COVID. So all of those things are, uh, you know, deeply seared in everyone's memories, and it takes, um, you know, it just takes us uh, ensuring that that compassion is at the forefront of our mind when we're uh, having what can turn into, you know, sometimes technical conversations. The final thing that I'll say is that um, something that I have to remind myself of, I guess, is the best way of putting it, which is it really matters to start with with the why. Um, you know, before we talk about three feet versus six feet or, you know, masks and no masks or how frequently should testing be done, um, I always try to root any, um, you know, any of my remarks in uh, in the why of school, you know, the fact that in-person learning is so critical, not just from an educational perspective, but from a health perspective. Um, and what I found is that, uh, you know, that really helps to orient the conversation in the right way. Um, and, and things uh, sort of naturally follow once you have anchored it in, uh, in some of the big picture of the why. So... I'll, I'll stop there for now, but, uh, but thanks so much. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, Di is having some communication problems. So we're going to shift and start with a question um, that let, let's throw this to, to you, Dave. I, I want to shift this into a question about the necessity of timeliness in COVID-19 communications. Earlier this week, the AAP released new guidance for schools including recommending that everyone age two and up wear a mask in schools regardless of vaccination, which prompted a very impassioned conversation over my dinner table last night. How do you balance building public trust by communicating early versus meeting the challenge of timely and specific updates as new information emerges, such as this latest update? So how do we maintain credibility when we are still learning more and more each day about the virus, the variants, and how best to interact with this? Terrific question that really gets at the heart of the challenge that we have. Um, you know, I, you, you, uh, I'm sure know, Brian, and, and those on the call, um, the CDC has a mantra around risk communication. Be first, be right, be credible. Um, well, it sounds so simple. <laughs> you know, of course, we want to be first, be right, and be credible. But you know what this question points up is that sometimes, um, sometimes those things are intention. You can't always be credible if you're first, um, because you know things uh, have to unfold over time. Um, actually, just as a very uh, specific example, I learned about the AAP guidance while I was on a press conference with the mayor, and a reporter, you know, asked the question and said, "Oh, you know, the AAP issued this guidance and." Uh, you know, so just just a snapshot of how um, we're being asked to process things in real time. My my imperfect answer to this would be: um, I think we do have to resist some of the impulse that we have in public health as scientists. Uh, that sometimes, you know, we we want to have the fully fleshed out answer, um, and that's not possible in the conditions of a pandemic. And I think that, you know, what I've tried to do with my team is to remind us that we have to extend one another um, grace, particularly when it comes to these types of communications. And actually, you know, in my experience, people have appreciated the humility of us saying, well, look, this is what we thought when we had, you know, this set of facts. Now other facts have emerged, and so we're updating our assessment, you know, as a result of it. Um, but all to say that I think we have to yank a little bit um, more in the direction of timely communication because it is so craved and so important, you know, for um, for the people whom we're serving, of course, but also the people whom we're enlisting as partners. Um, you know, obviously for this conversation, it's the teachers, the principals, you know, the school staff. Um, our colleagues in the Department of Education who are really looking for uh, at least a direction from us, if not um, the full guidance. So, um, so those are my thoughts. And how do you balance, though, the, the need for credibility, but at the same time having humility because we are still learning? 
How do you strike that balance in Alaska? It's a huge challenge. Um, uh, yeah, I was thinking back on the pandemic earlier and, you know, what were the big challenges? I mean, we knew so little and we continue to learn so much today. Um, and I think that that humility, Dave mentioned, is incredibly important. You know, I, I too see patients and I think a lot about shared decision making um, and making sure that patients have the information they need, but knowing that they are ultimately the owners of their health and hearing what they need and making a shared decision at the bedside with them on what they need to do. And I really see public health in the same sort of way. We need to have robust two-way communication so that we can have shared decision-making with the public. What are our priorities? What are our values? And how do we move there? So when we think about schools, you know, our priorities and values are healthy, well, children, communities, educators. You know, as just Dave mentioned, everyone's had uh, very different experiences with COVID. It's been hard and traumatic for so many in different ways, but it has looked really different. Uh, and so I think providing that space and grace to allow people to have experienced these different experiences, but being able to have a robust, regular dialogue. We started a series of Zoom meetings in the state, and like every Wednesday from 12 until 1, we do a public science echo. And our team, our virologists and epidemiologists and school health team just take questions from the public. Um, just a way to hear from them. It makes us better as a team. Um, but it provides a regular way. We do the same thing for schools. We do the same thing for the mayors. We do the same thing for industry partners, uh, just to create that kind of shared decision-making in public health. I think it's also important not only to think about why, but to realize that we don't have a magic bullet. And I think when we look at uh, schools, the ones like three feet or six feet or masks or here, or like this one thing, and I think it's really easy to talk about these things in a dichotomous, like safe or super risky. And the reality is, is there's a lot more gray between this space. And when I look around the country in the world and in Alaska and say, you know, where are we doing well and where are we failing? It's when we collectively work together that we succeed. And it's when we divide that we fail. And so I think continuing to build on the fact that we need our children in school. We want them to be well. We want them to be healthy. That is kind of a universal uh, goal. We also have to realize that COVID is here with us. And so what are the tools that we can use? And that's going to look really different in Ukviadvik, you know, which is our largest elementary school way above the Arctic Circle, where they're all in one building and can't go outside in the winter and there's polar bears. And it looks like an Anchorage and then it looks like David New York. And so I think having a one size fits all uh, is challenging, but having a one goal uh, for being healthy and well together, I think is where we need to continue to focus and be less focused on the, the, the small variations that we see in different protocols and places because they're going to be used differently in different places. Well, and that's, that really leads into our next question, because I don't think, and I could be wrong, I mean, I've lived in New York City for a while, and I don't think I ever encountered a polar bear, so probably not something you have to deal with in New York City, Dave, but in Alaska, where things are different, it's a big state, you have different communities, you have different ideologies dispersed amongst those communities. How do you tailor your messages to your local communities, but still stay consistent? How do you engage different groups? And I'll, I'll start with you, Anne, but Dave, New York City, those of us who live there know it is as diverse as anything. Uh, you only have to go a couple blocks and you're almost in an entirely different place. So again, that, how do you keep these messages fresh and locally focused um, while still maintaining consistency? So Anne, let's start with you. Yeah, no, it's a fun question. It's fun to think about, you know, Dave's challenges in New York, which sometimes I uh, don't envy at all uh, with a lot more people in a dense space. Alaska is huge. It's beautiful. It's bigger than California, Texas, and Montana combined. You know, we have more coastline than the East Coast and West Coast combined. Um, and it's has some really unique challenges. I think again, it goes back to core values. Like within our department, our mission is the health and well-being of Alaskans. And part of the reason I took that job is I really believe in that mission. Like what makes us healthy and well? And I think building from that, uh, you can meet different community needs in different ways. I also think it's about listening uh, and hearing what those community needs are and tailoring your response to be able to respond to that. So Alaska has had a fairly hands-off response about just providing information and resources to communities rather than telling communities how and what they should do because it is so diverse and it is different. I also think that it's really important that we build in diversity in our conversations as well as our response. Um, and so we've seen in this pandemic huge health inequities. And we saw early on in this pandemic how we stepped on each other's toes. Early on, we you know got some testing and our tribes got some testing. And while some clinics had two different names to it, we sent both the same testing and other clinics got none. And it was really clear that if we didn't form really robust partnerships early 
And before things uh, got worse, that we were going to be stepping on each other's toes and not meeting that mission of, of all of us working together and the health and well-being. So for example, our vaccine team, we built on our experience with Healthy Alaskans 2020 and 2030, where we had tribes at the table with the state at every single level. So billing, payment, communications. And so when vaccine came in, they were at the table and we were able to get it out across the state. And honestly, they ran the last mile, but we just got it to the hubs and they took it and dog sled and uh, plane and boat and all sorts of great things. But we really just empowered local communities with that. But we had to build in uh, that diversity at the table prior to vaccine coming up uh, to be able to build forward. And I think we need to do more of that moving forward. I think we need to build schools more into the conversation. I think we need to build industry and, and, um, and our employers more into the conversation uh, so that we're able to be able to respond uh, more holistically. It's not just about providers and patients and public health, but it's also about the public. It's about the press. It's about how we all live and work in these communities environments and building in that structure so that we can address inequities early and often. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate your comments, Anne, and um, you know, I'll elaborate a little bit, but I think the idea of empowering partners um, is, uh, you know, is, is a linchpin of, of getting tailored messaging right. Um, but first, I wanted to say that, you know, even though we don't have polar bears uh, in New York City, I, I wanted to invoke a snowball to make a little bit of an analogy in terms of what, how I think tailored messaging, um, you know, should proceed if we get it right. And it starts with, you know, the core is really around um, the science. And I, I, you know, as I'm, I'm sure you believe, Anne, you know, I think that we are the stewards of science-based information, of the facts. And, um, and that's the core, you know, of the, of the snowball um, that we have to then set in motion. And the setting in motion is the most important part. This is where the actual tailoring of the message happens. And to me, that hinges on having the right feedback loops. That means getting in the venues where you're gonna get the questions. You know, you go through your, these are the three things we know, you know, based on the science. And then as I'm sure is familiar to you, well, here are the 400 questions, you know, that flow from the three things that you have told us. Um, and, but setting up those feedback loops is not always straightforward. You know, that is an art in and of itself with respect to, making sure that you have, um, you know, focus groups, making sure that you have, uh, you know, the right um, town halls, uh, and making sure that this happens as close to the ground as possible, um, you know, in terms of getting people who are actually going to be in the school environment able to pose their questions directly and pressure test, you know, what, um, what our approach might look like. So all to say those feedback loops are particularly important for um, tailoring our messaging. I'll say on a personal note, my wife is an assistant principal, so I often have a very sharp uh, feedback loop at my own dinner table at night for any, uh, you know, any public health messaging that we're rolling out. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is just to build on, on um, you know, equipping uh, partners and empowering them with the right information. And, you know, we've talked about humility a lot. And I think this begins with the idea that, um, as we've seen certainly during the vaccination campaign, uh, in many cases, it's actually more about the messenger than about the message. And, but, you know, that requires um, public health and, you know, doctors and other clinicians to take a step back so that other people can take a step forward. And our job is to figure out how it is that we can lift them up, meaning get them the right platforms and the venues, and also provide, again, the information that's rooted in science. No, thank you. So last question, and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience. Remember, just send your questions to all panelists um, and we'll take it from, from there. But the last question, think about, your biggest communication challenge that you faced throughout the pandemic and what you did to meet it. So Anne, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I was thinking about that. And I guess I would do two parts. One, the first part of the pandemic and the second part, the second part. I think just the limited resources and how hard those were to get um, was, and being able to communicate about that was a huge challenge. You know, so much emphasis on things like ventilators. If you don't have a person to run a ventilator, then that doesn't do anything for the actual. So, you know, communication, people being really focused on one 
widget uh, about saying this is going to be the thing that's going to save us rather than the whole picture. Um, so I think just really always starting with taking a step back and explaining how we get there and then answering the question like this is why ventilators need people and how you kind of get to that process in place. So I think that was really it. And I think for now in kind of the second phase or our half of this uh, pandemic, it, I think the big challenge for communication for me has just been um, not only the information, but how everyone has dispersed into their own echo chambers of information. I think when the pandemic first hit and we were, you know, watching what unfortunately was taking place in New York City and the Navajo Nation and Italy and other places, people were coming together to a unified source of information. But people have returned back to their normal patterns of accessing information. Uh, and so it's become much more challenging. And I think we need to really separate out informatics from information. And we need to think about the way we get information out in a very similar way that we think about a virus. You know, people are more susceptible or less susceptible to different messaging. People are more resilient and less resilient uh, based on kind of other lying health factors. Uh, that message spreads more easily or less easily depending on what type of message it is. So what can we take from our understanding of, of diseases and apply it to information so that we make sure that uh, people have access uh, to really the same information uh, that we have in a way that's understandable and trustworthy and reliable. So I, I kind of broke it down into two because it's been different as the pandemic has changed. Dave. Um, thanks. Yeah, so many communication challenges. So, you know, it's it's difficult to narrow in, but um, but certainly, you know, school reopening last September um, here in New York City, I mean, that's a period that was extraordinarily challenging for us with respect to trying to get the communication right. Um, I'm really proud that we were the, you know, we're the largest school district and we were one of the only large metropolitan areas um, to commit to uh, reopening our schools to in-person instruction last September. Uh, and that's really thanks to, you know, the leadership of our mayor who, um, who charged us to do it in a way that was safe. Um, but there were a number of open questions at that point, you know, with respect to what were the evidence-based ways to ensure um, safety for people who are coming, uh, you know, into that in-person environment. We developed, you know, the idea of, of um, layered approaches to prevention, which, you know, you've heard uh, quite a bit now, um, you know, in terms of how we were going to communicate that it, there was no single silver bullet to how schools would remain safe. And that has been a really key part of, um, of our communication more longitudinally, because we've been able to add some layers, obviously, particularly with vaccination. And we've been able to say, you know, when something needs adjustment, whether it's distancing rules or uh, otherwise, that, you know, that the whole goal is to, to be able to rely on that full set of the layers of protection that we have. Um, and I think the other thing is, is transparency in sharing data, you know, over, um, over time. Uh, we committed to a certain um, testing uh, regime at the, at the beginning, at, you know, during last September. Um, and from, from the get-go, we shared the results of what we were finding, you know, in the school system both in terms of our test positivity rates, um, also how many schools and classrooms, you know, were closed at any time. Uh, and I think that that helped in ensuring that, um, you know, that people knew that they had objective measures that they could look at as well, that we were, of course, also following um, to, you know, to understand where we stood with respect to school safety. And while we are Fighting a pandemic, we also continue to fight the dual pandemic of technological challenges. And fortunately, though, Daya has joined us and we've introduced you, but we'd love to hear kind of you know, one thing that we would love to hear from you is how do you message differently to so many different constituencies, families, students, teachers, school officials, also in the context of a political environment that is changing from school district to school district. So Daya, um, welcome. And, and that's probably a hard question to start you off with, but I'm sure you're up to it. Thank you so much, Brian. And and it's good to be with you, Dave. And, and I, uh, as you said, Brian, you know, I could be really frustrated right now. Uh, and I am a little bit, but I know that our teachers and educators went through this every day this year. And so I got, I have no complaints. <laughs> uh, thank you for your patience. I, um, yeah, we, um, have been saying all throughout this pandemic that we want our schools to be the safest place in any community. And we are 
a very diverse organization. We have 3 million members. We're the largest union in the country. And our members are teachers and educators. So it is the custodians that clean the buildings and manage the ventilation systems. They are the cafeteria workers and the school nurses and librarians, as well as those classroom teachers in, in K-12 schools and on college campuses. I say that to not only introduce who make up our membership, but to say our membership looks a lot like America. It's 3 million, one in every 100 people is an NEA member. Um, and they represent the broad spectrum ideologically, um, you know, socioeconomically, and they represent very uh, different perspectives all over the country. And so one of the things we've had to do is, um, and I'll give you a very concrete example of this, is, you know, we have to tailor our messaging. We've done a lot of polling. We talk to our members constantly. Um, we think everyone should be talking to our members and, and listening to educators because they are experiencing it day to day. Um, you know, I think as Anne and Dave have said, you know, it's one thing to say six feet, you know, and mask. It's another thing to get the two-year-old to do that, right? Um, and to pay attention to a screen for uh, six hours in a day, you know. So we have done so much to try and educate our membership and um, make sure they're up to speed and that there's a comfort level and that they are both, that they are safe and their students are safe, safe and that they feel safe. And that's, you know, those are two very different things, being safe and feeling safe, feeling like you're gonna go back to a classroom that is ready for you to be back and to be instructing and all the, uh, using all the best practices that our educators uh, know. Um, a very concrete example of kind of how we adjusted and shifted messaging is with vaccines, game changer, right? I mean, it, um, we advocated, you know, that educators be prioritized, but then we had to message to them because they were in different places getting different information. And as you said, Brian, in a highly politically charged environment, you know, we've done lots of polling on our of our members, lots of public polling um, of both parents and students to craft messages. So one of the very concrete things we've done is we've done our Vax to School um, campaign and what we do there is for our members that are vaccine hesitant, and these are predominantly members of color, our black members in particular, as well as our most conservative members, they have been the most hesitant um, to become vaccinated. I'm happy to say that since we did that polling in um, early April, almost 90% of our members are vaccinated now. We do targeted messaging. We use, um, over time, we have learned um, you know, the benefits of having our members do peer-to-peer -peer communication. They are some of the most trusted members in any community and they trust each other as well. So when we message, we wanna make sure we're using uh, our teachers' voices to do some of that heavy lifting um, and not um, having them uh, do the peer-to-peer -peer messaging, but also being as transparent as possible with the information, following the science, We've had Dr. Fauci on webinars. We've had FDA and CDC folks on webinars, just getting their questions answered. And again, making sure they both are safe and feel safe. And a lot of that comes from answering their questions and giving them as much information as we can um, from trusted messengers like their peers uh, to give them that confidence and comfort level. And, you know, we are just so confident that uh, schools can and should fully reopen um, we know how to do that now. We have all the tools. It's just a matter of will at this point in following the science. So thanks, Brian. Uh, thank you. And thank you for, for joining us today. So I'm, I'm going to take moderator's you know, choice here. I'm seeing a lot of the questions. I'm just going to cut through a lot of the, the, the language and we're going to get, I'm going to give you the hard question and hopefully you all still return my emails after the hard question. The folks on this, on this webinar are people who work in public health and we're all right now challenged with what do we say when, you know, in our community, we're wearing masks, but in the community over, they don't have a mask mandate where you have kids who, because of this, some kids are, are going to be you know, upset coming home from school where kids aren't wearing masks or people aren't compliant. We all know on this call that we are a politically divided nation right now. How do we practice public health in the most COVID compliant county and in the most COVID resistant county? So not necessarily what you're doing in your states or in New York City, but 
But how do we manage that as public health leaders? How do we how do we do that? Dave, why don't you start? You get the hard question first. This is truly a hard question and um, one that we're thinking about deeply because we encompass that in a place you know as large and diverse as New York City. Uh, in in many ways, you know we're um, we're across the spectrum that you're describing. Um, I think it starts with acknowledging that um, that addressing polarization has to be part of you know, how we think about solving the problems that we're charged with. Um, what I find that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there is a temptation to say, well, our job is to stick to the facts, you know, stick to the science and just put it out there and, um, you know, and, and let things sort of fall as they may. And I think we actually have to be more um, forward leaning than that. Uh, we have to, you know, accommodate for the, the reality of the polarization that you describe. Um, and that means actually, you know, making sure that we have people who can amplify, you know, the key messages that we have around safety, you know, particularly around vaccination, um, who, who also span, you know, the spectrum that we're talking about. Um, so I think that's one thing. The second thing that I'll just add briefly is that and this is, a, I acknowledge, like it's not a near-term solution, but is a longer-term conversation that we have to have in public health, which is just recognizing that we, what we're, the polarization of today reflects um, in many ways uh, historical injustice and, you know, historical patterns that are combusting with, uh, with a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, part of our job in public health, I think, is to um, is to say, well, you know, the patterns that we're seeing because they have to do with underlying trust and social cohesion, is that our responsibility as well with respect to making sure that we build that trust and try to foster that social cohesion over time. It's not something that you can do in days or weeks or even months, but I do think for the here and now, it, it sometimes shapes how you think about ensuring that you're not eroding trust through the steps um, that you're taking right now, and then committing to that longer conversation uh, over you know, a longer time span. Anne or Daya, what would you add? Definitely build on Dave's comment. I love the comment about like, we're not just here to provide the science. Like as a physician, I wouldn't just say, here's your blood pressure medication, then walk out the door. <laughs> like, you know, I would say, this is what it is. This is how it works. What questions do you have about it? How does your diet affect this? How about your stress? Let's talk about your larger life that you live in. And this might be an additional tool to help manage your blood pressure. And I think we need to think of public health in the same way. I think we really need to be able to approach people with where they're at and be able to understand the messages that we're sharing and hear from them and their concerns. As mentioned previously, I also think we need to build in those messenger groups. I brought that up. Um, you know, so Arkansas recently was doing these COVID conversations in the community, but having local teachers, local healthcare teams, and public health going in in partnership together. Every time that like, we try to do a radio or a press conference or news, we try to always layer it with a state person, a local person who has to do health, and then someone else in that community really knows that space to hear the questions differently and be able to answer them uh, differently. Because we all hear things differently and we provide different information. I get teased a lot that I oftentimes say, I appreciate that question. Uh, someone gave me a necklace that, you know, I appreciate that question. Uh, but I really do. I think that we need to encourage a two-way dialogue. And what makes me worried is when people are silent. When people are silent, we're missing the questions, we're missing the concerns, we're missing the voices that need to be raised. And I think we need to keep hearing from people who have significant questions about vaccine or about public health measures or about what's happening, acknowledge that they're real questions and they come from historical trauma, they come from fear of their family or their community, uh, and recognizing, appreciating, celebrating the fact that they can ask those questions uh, and being able to really hear them where they're at. So I, I, I continue to see in particularly vaccine, this um, you know, vaccinated versus unvaccinated war that is happening and saying, you know, well, they're unvaccinated, I'm vaccinated. The reality is we all wanna be healthy. What are the questions? Why are they at that place? Uh, and how can we really acknowledge that fear and that frustration or those concerns at, and be able to approach it collectively together? Yeah, I would uh, build on uh, Dave and Anne's points. Um, you know, the partnership and collaboration between schools and community is, it's critical. 
um, and with the public health officials, you know, who are the most trusted messengers right now, um, anywhere far, even above teachers right now, um, you know, pub people are looking to their doctors and to public health officials for information. And that is a good thing. And that happens most of the time, but we also have seen, we've seen school board uh, meetings just uh, disrupted, uh, sometimes violently uh, with just irrational um, folks uh, who are opposed to masks and opposed to quarantining. Sometimes it goes as far as state legislatures taking action um, to, um, to forbid uh, quarantining, like we just saw in Arizona recently. You know, and it elevates and stokes fear at a time when we need to do just the opposite, right? Which is come to this rationally, listening um, to the facts and making good decisions. We have found that it's two things making sure folks are focused on not just the facts, but on students. Students have been through it this year. Everyone wants them to be back with their peers learning and in school environments. And if we all agree on that, which I think we all do, whether you agree on vaccines or, or, or not, um, we all have that common, that, that in common. We all share that desire to be back in schools and school buildings. We're seeing this with summer camps and summer learning now. So, you know, if we can all um, uh, come to agreement that that's what we want, there is no reason that we can't do this. You know, there are some simple steps we need to take to make sure students stay safe. Um, and I appreciate the question, Brian, because it is something that we face. It is, it is very real. Um, and and it, it's very scary for, for so many of our, of our members who want to go back, want to be safe. They don't want to be uh, made to feel bad uh, for wearing a mask uh, or have a kid bullied. Um, or have it snatched off of them in a, on a school bus. Those things are happening, you know, and so um, there is the messaging piece. And then, of course, for us, we're an advocacy organization. We also train our members to advocate for themselves and for their students, letting them know these are your rights. You have a right to ask for this. You have a right to be safe. Here is what safety means, right? And we try to tailor that given their context and the realities, you know, of the grade levels that they're teaching because it varies wild, widely. You know, some are elementary school where you have a mixed set of circumstances with vaccines and some are at the college level. So it's very different. Um, but yeah, that, that collaboration piece, what we have found is that in some cases, schools didn't close at all, you know, and so making sure people understood that. And in the cases where they opened and stayed open, what we have found is collaboration and partnership, a lot of transparency. Parents understood that, yep, we may be closed tomorrow, but in, in 10 days, we're going to open because our school nurse is going to tell us she's the person on point. They had a plan. They had very clear and regular, consistent communication to those families, and that trust was there. Um, so, you know, getting to that place is ultimately our North Star. We want that level of collaboration between schools and communities. So another theme in the, the questions um, <clears throat> for Dave and for Ann, me and a lot of people on this call, we're all very cognizant of the idea that we all serve at the pleasure of when we're working in governmental public health. What do you do when your school board is not necessarily supporting good public health science? and maybe engaging in disinformation or believing disinformation. What's, how do we best engage when those elected leaders may not be supporting public health science? Yeah, I'm happy to start, you know, um, we all serve at the pleasure of, but I, and I don't think about that as the person of the school board or the governor or the president. Those people are elected by the people. And so we serve at the pleasure of the people of the state. Um, I always say that I try to make sure I'm saying the same thing at a school board meeting to my family, to the governor, regardless of where it is, that it will be the same information that comes out. I think, again, finding those common values is super important and understanding where people are at. And then sometimes asking offline why they may think something. So you hear something on a school board meeting or a, um, you know, a political uh, appointee saying something and just reaching out and saying, hey, I heard that you said this. Do you have some questions about the Israeli data you quoted or about whatever the topic may be? Um, because I, I heard that you had, we've got a team of virologists and epidemiologists. I'd love to talk to you more about it. 
Um, I think that I think about the quote from Frozen all the time that you know people make choices when they're like mad or scared or threatened. Um, and I think that if we you know step away and make sure that we're not threatening, uh, but really have a robust conversation, we have much more in common. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, you hear the quote that like when you get public health and politics, you always end up with politics. And I guess I would disagree with that. I think that at the end of the day, uh, we all serve the people of the states or the cities that we serve. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we're transparent, as Dave had mentioned earlier, if we partner, if that is, I love the fact that Deanna used North Star, that we're all kind of finding that that common ground together. I think it can really diffuse that political situation and, and work collaboratively together. So I think choosing to not focus on political nature, but focusing on uh, the common beliefs and values, uh, and then really bringing the science and data to the table so that we can we can have a robust conversation about what we know and what we don't know. So I'm going to pivot this question a little bit for my friend Dave, just to make it a little harder for you, Dave. Um, when you hear it, I mean, we hear disinformation, right? The vaccine doesn't work. It doesn't exist. So I'm, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm saying to you, you know, yeah. Dr. Chuck, say, I don't believe you. I don't believe in this vaccine and, and you just want to take my freedoms from my kids. What do you say? What What's your response to me? How do you diffuse me? Um, tough, tough. You're going to have to add this to the tough Q&A for um, the PHCC, which I which I love to follow. Um, I, you know, I, I thought Anne's response uh, was was right on. And I think that the idea that we all serve at the pleasure of the people is, you know, is the common ground that we have to stand on. To your tough question, Brian, there are some bright lines that have to be drawn in circumstances where there is active disinformation, you know, misinformation, where it's not a matter of um, different values, but is truly a matter of different facts. Then, um, and I think that you know that has to be called out. Uh, and I think that setting those bright lines for oneself, um, again, this is, you know, some of my own uh, internal dialogue, particularly during a time of crisis, but setting those bright lines to understand, um, well, this is an opportunity to have conversation, to change a mind, or this is an opportunity to be really black and white about what the facts are, what the science shows, and where, you know, someone might be flat out wrong. Um, I think our impulse should always be, you know, to the point of your question, to diffuse, to find common ground. Because to Anne's point, usually that exists if we search hard enough for it. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the things that I found just to the point of, of how to do this from a communications perspective is uh, knowing very early on in a conversation, if it's not going to be about the data, to really shift to stories and to understand the anecdotes both that someone else might have in mind and share some of the anecdotes you know, that we have the privilege of bearing witness to because of where we sit. Um, and being able to you know, switch into that mode as quickly as, as we detect you know, something like that happening. Um, but if at the end of the day, you, know, you have done that due diligence and there is truly a difference in facts, then it's our responsibility as as public health leaders to uh, to stand behind um, you know what we know the science to show. So much like Captain America, I could do this all day, but our time is running short. I want to thank you guys. I mean, you know, I I've known Dave and Ann for some time. They are outstanding health officials. The people of New York City and the people of Alaska are extraordinarily fortunate to have you at the helm during this crisis. Uh, they, uh, we have a lot to talk about with schools, and I hope this is a, a start of a, of, a, of a good dialogue because we do need public health and schools working much better together. And I hope we can find, I don't think this will be the last time we talk about this issue. And so hopefully we can get more input from you and I apologize for the, for the um, technical difficulties, but I appreciate what you've given us and hopefully you even will give us some insight because many things in the chat are very specific. And I think we'll be adding those to our tough questions. So with that, I believe this brings this webinar to a close. Again, thank the three of you for taking the time to share your insights. And thank you for joining us today on the webinar. And uh, in addition to these terrific insights, we have 
a, a ton of good information on the publichealthcollaborative.org website. We are actively working with folks in education and health. There's a focus group tonight that the Beaumont Foundation is doing to help develop some of these resources and ask the, answer the questions that so many of you have asked. Listen, everybody, it's hard out there. And we so respect what you're doing. And each of us is having to work within a context of disease prevalence and political realities. And we know that it's really hard for some of you out there. We want to support you. We want to help you as much as we can. If you are finding yourself in crisis in a communication sense, reach out to the PHCC, reach out to me, reach out to Mark Miller, uh, who's at miller at debeaumont.org, and we'll get your questions to where they need to be. Um, but we are here to help in a very hard time. Um, but we appreciate the work that you do and the fact that you've done it now consecutively for now going on you know, two years and with very little respite and without the resources that you need. And hopefully we will rectify that so we are never in this kind of position again. So thank you for your efforts and thank you for the work that you all do. Please let us help. To the panelists, thank you again. That's all I have for today. Just be safe.